Hi guys, and I'm back in the London store today. And today I've given myself the task of finding that perfect, big, dark, smoky tenor sax sound. And I just thought it'd be a nice kind of follow-up video from the kind of success, if you like, of the pop sax video I did recently, where I sort of explored different setup options. With the outer video, I was trying to find the combination of mouthpiece and saxophone to give me that nice kind of pop sax bright sound. But it's funny, it actually took me in a slightly different direction to that. It didn't end up just being a video about that sort of screaming altissimo, um, sort of alto bright sound that you might think it would be at the outset of the video. It sort of took me on a bit of a different journey. And I really like the sort of place that I ended up by the end of the video. So it's going to be interesting to see how today's video, and followed up by the sort of studio version tomorrow, compares with that video. So the task is to find a tenor saxophone set up, so saxophone, mouthpiece, reed, uh, ligature, that gives me that nice big sort of vintage, warm, kind of husky tenor saxophone sound um, that's often desired by many players. So I'm just going to walk along the racks. We're going to start by finding a saxophone. I'm going to wind back to this area here to the accessories and then look at the sort of setup side of things with the mouthpiece and the reed and all the rest of it. So let's walk on down this way, see what we are greeted with at first. So a lot of professional end instruments here, P. Moriat, great brand, actually for the kind of sound that we're talking about. So one of these saxes could easily be a contender in terms of you know, producing that, that big, warm, kind of vintage sound. Um, let's just move through the racks and sort of see what else we've got so I can get a few ideas floating around in my head. Um, so, yeah, Sig Customs here. Um, oh, my personal favorite right there, that's the Andy Shepard autograph. Um, uh, we've got Ramponi and Kazani, great brand for that sort of um, really professional depth of sound, very vintagey in its nature, if you ask me. And this could well be a contender for exactly what we're talking about here in terms of finding a, an expensive professional end tenor saxophone. Whereas what I'm going to do is when I get around to the other side of the racks, so I'm going to hopefully find more of a student instrument that's going to give me that, that budget end of things. So I think I'm going to plump for this saxophone right here. This is the Ramponi and Kazani two voices tenor. Beautiful handmade tenor. Uh, so we've got bronze down the middle, we've got sterling silver on the top and bottom ends here. And one of the defining features of the way the Ramponi tenors work is that, well, so within their engineering, is that they have a really wide bore and that really defines the sound. I mean, it's all about the geometry when it comes to defining the sound of a saxophone. Um, some of the comments actually in the pop video um, talked about me mistakenly talking about the finish as having a defining effect on the tone. I'd just like to go back on that point a little, if I may. I agree, it is much more about the geometry of the saxophone. Um, which is why with this Ramponi tenor in my hands here, I can state that it has a different bore geometry to other sort of standard, you know, Selma type designs. And this does actually have a dramatic effect on, on the sound. Um, yes, it's true to say that if you just change the plating or the finish, um, the effect is going to be much less extreme. Um, it's going to be more nuances that you're dealing with. Um, but based on the fact that the this has such a wide bore, it's got a different geometry to, as I say, Selma, Yanagizawa type instruments, it's going to give us a different blowing experience. So that's going to be my expensive professional end tenor. I'm just going to put that back safely for the time being. So let's wander around here, past some other professional instruments, Selmas, Yanagizawas, and take ourselves to the student side of things. I say student side of things, I'm greeted with some high-end Yamahas right here. Uh, but as I move further down, we're more into a sort of student intermediate sphere here. Um, Con Selma's particularly good, solid student horns. And I'm looking here at an ATS Con Selma tenor, which I think could do a great job as being more of a budget option. So this one currently is only gonna set you back, well, only, £1,149, but it's way cheaper than the two voices. Um, and for me, um, okay, I've not tried it yet. We'll try it in the studio tomorrow with the mouthpiece setups that we come across. But for me, this is a really nice, solid, um, sort of advanced student stroke intermediate tenor option. 
Um, and it's going to be interesting to contrast this, much more of a standard bore geometry setup with the Ramponi that I've just mentioned. So let's pop that back on the case, the case, the stand, and take a stride over to the accessories. Okay. So, here we have the mouthpieces and we are looking for tenor mouthpieces and I'm going to start by finding that more budget end mouthpiece moving through to a, a pro end mouthpiece. Now again, the subject of today's video is a more dark setup. So I'm not going to be looking for baffled pieces. I'm not going to be looking for a piece that has a small chamber. I'm going to be looking for more rollover baffle or lower set baffles with a larger chamber to get that sound. So immediately on the left here, I'm greeted with uh, you know, Yamahas, Van Dorens. For me in general, Van Dorens tend to be a bit more middle of the road in terms of their sort of depth of sound. But as I scroll through here, I see the famous Otto Link headers. And I think that's where it's gonna be at for me. Uh, this one currently is only 120 pounds for a hard rubber or ebonite Otto Link tenor piece. And that is gonna do the job really well. We just need to have a, a nice sort of medium tip opening six star, seven, seven star, that kind of area. That will suit me very nicely. And that is going to be my budget setup. I'll just take it out of the cabinet so you can get a better look at that. Here we go. So that is an Ottolink hard rubber. Um, very popular in terms of an upgrade mouthpiece for tenor sax players, aspiring tenor sax players. If you've been playing for two, three, four years and you've never changed your mouthpiece, this should be the first one on your list to think about as an upgrade model and it's going to do very nicely for this dark tenor saxophone test that I'm about to do. On the pro end of things, let's just scroll through a few options. Uh, Drake's, they could work very nicely. Bagonzi, it's a lovely Master Series um, pro end mouthpiece. That could do the job. 10M fan, they've got some, some lovely kind of hef, hefty, kind of depthy sounding mouthpieces. But as I move through, oh, this is a lovely one here. Oh no, actually I thought it was something else. Ah, here we go. This is the one I'm talking about. We've actually got these two lined up together because they've got a similar red marble finish, but they're quite different. This is a little bit of departure here, sorry folks. This is the Shiva by uh, Theo One, which is a bit of a screamer. Look at that baffle. And this is gonna be the subject uh, of some videos to come, a beautiful mouthpiece. I'm not going to select it now, I'm going to save this for another video a little bit later on. This is the new Alexander Superior mouthpiece, which is a dark sounding mouthpiece. But I think I'm going to go to an old sort of faithful pro end um, dark sounding mouthful, uh, mouthpiece, which is the Theo Wani Ambika. Now, this is their generation two model, and having just seen a Theo out in the NAM show in America, He's just introduced uh, the three model, uh, the third generation, which um, if I remember rightly, he's removed even more material from, uh, sort of scooped uh, more material from inside uh, the, the rails here. Didn't actually get the chance to try it, so I can't wait to try that third generation mouthpiece, but I know that these guys are great. So this is the Ambika 2, currently 519 pounds, <laughs> and I'm gonna compare that with this. Otto Link with those two saxophone setups that you saw me select there. Going to do it in the studio tomorrow. Tune in for the next part. Right folks, back in the studio again now and surrounded by these setups that I selected in the London store earlier. Now I didn't really get into the subject of this earlier, but the reed is so crucial in determining the type of sound that we produce as sax players. And even just swapping out uh, for the, uh, the same reed within the brand the same cut can make a massive difference uh, to the tonal performance and the kind of resistance and the feeling that you get as a player, let alone going for something completely different, a completely different brand. So that's what I've decided to do right now. Swap out for a different read to the one I would normally use. So I'm normally a Daddario Jazz Select guy, but I've got a Van Doren traditional read on uh, for the purposes of this video. The reason being is that the Van Doren traditional read for me produces a very dark kind of lacy sound, um, almost a little bit resistant in, in the way it uh, speaks when you're trying to push air through it. 
And I thought that that would marry in with the kind of styles that I'm trying to, to look for today with my uh, gear selection. So um, I'm kind of putting myself outside my comfort zone by going in with a Van Doren uh, traditional read. And earlier on when I was just um, testing these setups, I really couldn't believe the difference it makes uh, changing from my regular read, the Select Jazz, to the Van Doren traditional. So rather than going for a whole load of combinations, in fact it would be eight combinations altogether if I was to try every single setup with two reads, I thought I'd stick with the Van Doren traditional uh, for the four setups, but just slot in the Select Jazz read right at the end when I'm on the, the Ramponi two voices, just so you can hear the differences. Um, as, as I say, it's so crucial. Um, it can really change everything. It's amazing that we spend, you know, four or five thousand uh, pounds on a horn like this, and yet you spend three pounds on a reed, and it just changes everything. It's kind of game changer, really. So anyway, back to the subject in hand. Let's get immediately going on the Con Avant uh, 180 sax. Uh, so just to remind you, we've got it here with uh, an Otto link. This is a seven star tip opening. And this is the Van Doren traditional two and a half, fresh out the box, had about five minutes of play. And we have a Rovner dark ligature. It seemed like the obvious choice in terms of trying to produce a sort of dark vintagey sound. So let's see how all this marries up together. <laughs> Okay, so my immediate thoughts there, and I won't babble on for ages, um, is that it is a very pleasant, warm sound. I mean, it's exactly kind of what we're looking for in terms of the criteria of this video, if you like. For me personally, I'm struggling a little bit because I find there's a lot of resistance with this setup. And again, I go back to my earlier comments on the reed. Uh, it's quite a sort of fresh out the box Van Doren traditional reed here, and I can kind of feel the stuffiness in there. It's a very nice sound, I think maybe two or three hours playing this and it would break in and have some slightly different qualities, but basically the same sound concept would still be there. So we've got a large chamber Otto link here that gives that big warmth of sound, nice sort of buffy sound. Um, the, the instrument, this is just a good solid working student instrument. It's not particularly taking the sound in a certain direction because um, just to remind you of the sort of chain of influence in terms of um, how uh, the sound is produced and having the most influence on the sound. It is number one, the player, it's me, then we've got the reed, then we've got the mouthpiece that ligature set up, and then the saxophone. And so hopefully I will be able to demonstrate those points as I go through this exercise towards the end. But initially, very nice sound, just a little bit more on the stuffy side. I felt like I couldn't really play in any other style other than that kind of slightly lazy kind of jazz thing. It wouldn't really push out into a kind of funk style, you know, if I really tried to give it some energy, the sound would still have those same tonal qualities that you heard there. So let's now immediately shift over to the Ambika mouthpiece with the same reed, same league, same sax and see what difference it makes. <laughs> Well, it's definitely a different playing experience from the link. There's a lot more um, projection and push and definition really in the sound. I think that's more the word. Still a little bit resistant to me. And I think again, that's the read. You know, it's the same read I've just used just a minute ago there. So we're, we're gonna get the same basic sound characteristics. And I think that's an important point to make, but it's channeled in a different way with the mouthpiece. Um, and that's obvious, you know, it's 
even though this is a very large chamber mouthpiece, it's the darkest one that uh, Theo produces, it's still actually got more kind of clarity and, and sort of projection uh, than the Link. Um, Link. Link's are really great mouthpieces for upgrading onto for that sort of warmth of sound, or just a good, nice standard tenor sound. But they can lack a little bit of kind of clarity and definition. And so when you move through to these mouthpieces, like these sort of high-end Theos here, they're produced with such uh, precision in the way that they're engineered that it really makes a difference in terms of the overall results you get from them. So uh, for me, I feel a definite improvement as I migrate from that Autolink setup to the Ambika there. Um, it's going to be interesting now to try the same setups again, but on this expensive beast of a saxophone. So let's move over to the two voices. Okay, so I've got the two voices here now. Now, in my excitement earlier on, I was talking about this two voices as being a bronze body instrument. Now, there are two choices with the two voices. It's either bronze or brass, and I got it wrong. This one is, in fact, brass. Pretty obvious now you look at it. I don't know why I thought it was bronze earlier. It makes a little bit of a difference in terms of the tone. I find bronze has a little bit more punch in it, perhaps an added element of warmth there. Um, but largely, as I mentioned earlier, it's to do more with the geometry of this instrument. It's got a wider bore, um, it's got delicious solid silver going on here and here, and particularly the crook makes such a difference. Again, this is the business end of the saxophone, it's right next to the mouthpiece, uh, makes such a crucial difference, the material and then the shaping within the crook on the neck. So let's give this a go. We've got the Otto Link on here, back to that setup, and of course the Van Doren Reed. Very nice. I just had to try a few punchy notes at the end there just to kind of feel the layering in the sound, which is something again I described earlier. Um, you really do feel a change of tone as you move from uh, this sort of more basic uh, student instrument to this incredible professional instrument. I mean there's still the, the sound going on there with the mouthpiece where there's that feeling of kind of resistance for me in the reed, but the sound on the horn is opening up to a different degree. Um, even with the, the sort of basic Otto Link setup here. Um, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, I feel I can just play out a little bit more. I feel it's projecting more, but there's a lot of body in the sound, a lot of weight. Um, again, this has um, a big bore, way bigger than most of the standard conventional uh, instruments out there, and it does make a difference. But you do need to fill up, you know, you, you can't just uh, take a shallow breath and expect to get good results from this instrument. It really does require the player to put all the air down at everything you've been taught since the word go. So that's the Otto Link on the two voices. Let's move on to the Ambika. <laughs> running out of air right at the end there. But again, it's that big, warm, resistant kind of sound. 
with, again, with the mouthpiece, the Ambika, a little bit more clarity on it and perhaps edge when you really push it there, uh, certainly at the top anyway, on those top Ds and, and the like. But there's always body behind the sound because of the large chamber going on and the large space inside this horn. And then that Van Doren reed is just adding that sort of layering of darkness in the sound there. So there's a lot to get into there. I mean, it's a real workout for me there. I was really having to push it. And some players with a great lung capacity and ability to push air through faster and, uh, and you know, just with more volume in their chest might love this kind of setup if that's the kind of sound that they gravitate towards. For me, I'm a slightly different player. Um, I won't get into that right now. So it's not my ideal setup, but I really appreciate uh, the kind of qualities that you can get from a setup like this. So it's great. I hope you saw the kind of step-like sort of evolution in sound as we changed through four setups there. I did mention at the start that I want to change reed just to show the difference that that can make. So I'm now going to flick reeds over, see what the Daddario Select Jazz does for me. <laughs> So there you go, quite a different thing altogether. I mean, maybe that doesn't come across as so different to you guys at home compared to me, but it's a completely different playing experience. Uh, what I get on the Select Jazz compared to the Van Doren, I don't want to make this all about the reed, but it's too late, uh, is a sound that I can just relax on. I don't have to actually blow through it with the resistance that I get on the Van Doren. It's great, this Van Doren, in terms of that lovely, big, buffy kind of sound, warmth of sound. Um, but with this one here, I feel I just get a, a bit more kind of colour in the sound. I can lay back on it. But the sound is definitely brighter, um, but hopefully with a sort of warmth and a heart in the sound there as well. For me, this isn't the greatest read. I think I could have selected a better one. It's a little bit too buzzy. That might come across. Uh, but it's highly playable. I feel like I can move through all the dynamics in all the different ranges I could move into the Altissima. Didn't quite do it there, but potentially I could. Um, so really the point I'm making, as I said at the outset, is that the reed makes such a difference. Just changing over from one three pound bit of cane to another three pound bit of cane, and it, it changes everything, despite the fact that we've got, uh, well, a seven and a half thousand pound instrument tagged onto the end of it. So hopefully you heard lots of different sounds there, five different sounds altogether, to be exact and it gives you some ideas for your own sort of setup choices. Um, I'm going to try and do more videos in this kind of style because I think it can be useful really, just comparing setups directly back to back. Um, I might go for more of a middle ground sort of setup uh, next time, so look out for that, it's just an idea I've had. But in the meantime, hope you've enjoyed the video. Remember, do subscribe, those of you who, don't, who just watch these videos and uh, you don't know anything about the channel, subscribe. We'd love to have more of you guys out there. So I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.